boldly going where no science show has gone before. The Naked Scientists. Hello, on The Naked Scientist this week, predicting one of the most important weather systems in the world, that's the Asian monsoon. How dreaming about something helps you remember it, what it feels like to be a pill after you've been swallowed, and how gene silencing stops stem cells from reaching their full potential. Plus, we'll explore the genetic evidence that shows we've all got a little bit of Neanderthal in us, and probably some of us more than others. I'm Dr Kat Arney, and joining me this week is Diana O'Carroll. Thanks, Kat. Also on the way this week, we're looking at the science of archaeogenetics. What can DNA tell us about the past? We'll find out about the impact of genetics on archaeology, what it can tell us about human origins, and how we can use genetic techniques to discover some very personal details about ancient people. Plus, Mira Senthalingham finds out what we can learn about the diseases that evolved alongside, or rather, inside our ancestors. And Ben and Dave test an ancient way of sterilising water. That's all to come on today's Naked Scientists. If you want to get in touch with any questions or comments, we'd love to hear from you. Our email address is chris at thenakedscientists.com. The Naked Scientist podcast, powered by UK Fast, the UK's best hosting provider. On the web at ukfast.net. This is The Naked Scientists with me, Dr Kat Arney. And I'm Diana O'Carroll. I'm going to kick off this week with the discovery of all the history about Asian monsoons. Researchers this week have presented for the first time a record of ancient monsoon data stretching over 700 years. The Asian monsoon affects nearly 5 billion people each year, but it involves a huge weather system and it's very hard to predict how it will change each year. Until now, there's been very little climate data available on the monsoon. So... Who's this doing this and what have they done? Well, it's Edward Cook and colleagues from Columbia University and they've measured tree ring data from over 300 locations, that's a lot of drilling, and they've compiled it into what they call the Monsoon Data Drought Atlas, or MADA. And it's published in the journal Science and they've been able to reconstruct how the monsoon varied from the end of the medieval warm period through the Little Ice Age, where Louis XIV's wine supposedly froze on his table, and during the more recent period of human-induced climate change. Well, that's a lot of data, but what can they do with it? What can it tell us? Well, the researchers plan to compare this record with others available, so they could, for example, see how sea surface temperatures alter the monsoons, and occasionally the monsoon will fail completely, leading to droughts which destroy crops and cause all sorts of species devastation. So finding the reasons for these events could help in their prediction in the near future good stuff and maybe the scientists would find it more useful to understand their data if they slept on it now have you ever found the advice to sleep on it often turns out to be true whether it's solving a problem or trying to learn something now we've known for some time that sleep helps us to remember things by helping the brain to file away and strengthen our memories and now new research from erin wamsley at harvard medical school published in the journal current biology provides more evidence that the best way to remember something is indeed to sleep on it and, more importantly, to dream about it. So how has she found this? Well, she and her team asked 99 volunteers to memorise the layout of quite a complicated computer maze, and then they were tested to see if they could get to a specific place in the maze after being dropped in it at a random starting point. And five hours later, the volunteers were tested again. But in the interim, some of them had had a nap, but some of them had been made to stay awake. So what were the two differences that they found between these groups? Well, they found that the people who'd had about an hour and a half shut-eye in between the tests managed to get through the maze an average of around three minutes faster than the first time they were tested. But the people who stayed awake only managed about 26 seconds faster. Right, what's that got to do with dreaming, though? Well, as well as seeing whether the volunteers had had a nap or not, Wamsley also asked the nappers whether they dreamed about the maze, and she found that people who dreamed about doing the task during their nap improved in the second test far more than the people who didn't. So it suggests that dreaming is actually a really powerful mental rehearsal for a task. Well, that's interesting, because we all know that dreams are often really weird. I mean, I have dreams that I'm in my old house, but looking for a toilet usually. (laughs) um, So how does that help? Well, it's very true that your dreams aren't really an accurate reflection of reality. And in these experiments, the volunteers also had some pretty wacky dreams. Uh, For example, when the volunteers described their dreams, they didn't talk about the specific maze or specific things in the maze. But they mentioned similar but related situations. So, for example, a different maze or being stuck in something like a cave. 
And intriguingly, she found that the people who found the maze task most difficult were more likely to dream about it. So maybe their brains were kind of panicking, processing all the information and maybe even worrying about having to do the test again while they were asleep. So thinking about something while you're asleep is actually more efficient at helping you to remember than thinking about it while you're awake. Well, that's what this does seem to suggest, but it's important to point out the researchers don't think it's the actual dreams that are improving our memory. It's more like dreams are a side effect of the underlying brain process, the sort of filing away that goes on while we're asleep. But based on this research, you might actually draw the conclusion it's best to study right before you go to bed at night, or alternatively, have a nap after you've done a really hard revision session. Indeed, sleep is always the cure for everything. Well, um, here's a, another not quite related but perhaps related to learning new story. Uh, this week, researchers in an international team from Switzerland, the Czech Republic and the US have managed to measure the forces felt by a small pill as it travels through the intestines. Is this some kind of fantastic journey thing? Have they shrunk down? Uh, what on earth have they done? <laughs> Sounds like it, doesn't it? Well, it's um, Brian Laulicht and colleagues, and they developed a technique using a dummy magnetic pill. And this was fed to both human and dogs, and they tracked its progress using an array of magnetic fields Field sensors held over the abdomen. Publishing in PNAS this week, not only could they detect the direction of gastric forces exerted on the pill, but also nice. the magnitude of those forces, and they could see how these changed through the stages of digestion. So, so what did they find? Well, they found that on a full stomach, both humans and dogs exerted similar gastric forces on the pill. But when both volunteers were fasted, the dog's innards exerted on average five times the force of the humans. So we now know that dogs' gastric systems are only similar to that of humans after they've been fed. Interesting why we might want to know that. Why do we need to know what happens to pills once you've eaten them? Well, it's, it's important because in order to make tablets as effective as possible, we need to know how long they can last uh, for inside the gut. So for some pills, at least, the longer they last inside you, the more effective they are at delivering their medicine. So the researchers hope that by modelling the gut forces in this way, they can design much more sophisticated pills than those currently on the market. Nice. I wish they'd work out why my parents' dogs keep being sick. <laughs> that would be very nice as well. Anyway, moving from uh, dog sick to stem cells. Uh, that's a really exciting area of science that we often do talk about on the show, mainly because I am a huge stem cell nerd. And now new research published in the journal Nature reports an important step forward in our understanding of stem cells and actually how we might be able to use them in the future. So what's this about then? Well, this is work from Comrade Hochidlinger at Harvard and his colleagues, and they've been trying to understand the difference between cells known as pluripotent stem cells, and these are stem cells that can make a limited number of different types of cells in the body, and embryonic stem cells. These can be converted into any of the 220 different types of cells in the body. Now, although these cells have the same genes, only certain sets of genes can actually be used in pluripotent stem cells and this explains why they have a limited potential to turn into different cells. And cloning experiments have shown that a single embryonic stem cell can be used to clone and create a whole new organism but it hasn't so far been done with pluripotent stem cells. So what did the researchers do? Well, they compared mouse embryonic stem cells with identical, genetically identical pluripotent stem cells to look for key differences in the patterns of gene activity between the two. Now, importantly, they found that a cluster of genes on chromosome 12 were switched off in the pluripotent stem cells, but not in the embryonic stem cells. And this region contains uh, quite a lot of genes that are very important for the development of the fetus of a baby. But how do they know that these genes are really important? Well, they looked at over 60 different pluripotent cell lines, that's different types of pluripotent cells, and they found that the same genes were switched off in most of them, suggesting that they are really important in this. And when they tested whether they could regenerate cloned mice from these pluripotent stem cells, they could only make them from the tiny handful of pluripotent cells where these genes weren't switched off. So, in fact, this is the first time, uh, thought to be the first time, that you've actually been able to clone mice using these pluripotent stem cells because they haven't switched off these crucial genes. Well, that's quite impressive, but what does this finding mean for stem cell research in general? 
Well, I think it's actually quite important. For a start, it allows researchers to tell whether the cells they're dealing with have the potential to generate every different cell type in the body or just a limited range. And this is going to become increasingly important in the future as stem cell technology comes closer to being able to be used in medical applications. Doctors need to be able to choose the best quality stem cells for the job. And it also tells us how to change the properties of stem cells, whether you actually want them to, to have a more restricted fate and switch certain genes off in this case, or whether you actually want to try and reactivate these genes so you have stem cells that could make any type of cells. So really interesting stuff I think there. Yeah, very potent bit of research there. Good of yeah. Also in the news this week, a new genetic analysis of nearly 2,000 people from all over the globe suggests that our ancestors interbred with Neanderthals on at least two occasions. We're joined by Professor Jeffrey Long, leader of the team at the University of New Mexico, who have reported on this finding. Good morning. What we looked at were genotypes, genetic typings from about 600 places throughout the genome from people from about 100 different populations throughout the world. And what did you look at in in their DNA? Well, we looked at subtle variations that are sometimes called microsatellite loci or short tandem repeat loci. And these are just regions of DNA. Typically, they don't code for any products that are sometimes called junk DNA, where people have small differences in the amount of DNA that they have. These are the kinds of genetic markers that are used in DNA fingerprinting and forensics and parentage testing and a lot of routine tests these days. So do we know if the microsatellites actually do anything? There are a few circumstances where they do. Most uh, notably, there's a microsatellite type of locus in the gene that is important for Huntington's disease. But there are only a couple dozen of those um, where they're actually in genes that do anything Uh, There are thousands of them throughout the genome, and uh, most of them, the vast majority of them, don't do anything. So when you looked at these microsatellites, what sort of genetic variations did you see? What we saw when we looked at these microsatellites is that people typically, and this is standard for genetics, people typically have different amounts of DNA in each of these, these locations, and they have more or less high mutation rates, by genetic standards at least. And because of that, we have all of these variations, and you get clustering of patterns throughout the world. And that's what we started looking at in in this study. We were interested in a model that's called the serial founder effects model. And with serial founder effects, what we've postulated is that other groups have postulated that uh, you had an original population in Africa, and then a small group left Africa and peopled Europe and Asia and eventually into Asia and the um, Oceania as well. We were uh, interested in studying that effect. So how did you find these clusters of variation varied geographically as well? Did they tie in with these models? Well, for the most part, what we found was that what you find outside of Africa is a subset of what you find in Africa, what you find in the, say, any region outside of Africa. Asia is a subset of all about Africa and the like. But the thing that surprised us was that in the out-of-Africa group, there was a little bit more variation than the model could account for. So we found variation in Eurasians, people in the Pacific Islands and the Americas, that couldn't be accounted for by the out-of-Africa migration. So you think this genetic information is, is coming from somewhere else? Yes. So we had to look at possibilities of, of where it could come from and what could account for it. Now, one of the things that our colleagues suggested to us is that it might be just by what we call gene flow, which is sort of the boy marries girl next door effect that goes on throughout the world, where people in these different regions do occasionally mate with each other. But that couldn't account for the effect, and in retrospect, it really could not have, because that sort of gene flow just... Um, It just uh, spreads things around. It doesn't create or or destroy variation itself. And then what we eventually came to the conclusion of is it would have had to have been from essentially hominids that were like people that were existing in this area, or at least we think that's the best explanation at this time. So one possibility would be Neanderthals. And if it was, what does that mean for human populations? Well... Neanderthals are certainly a possibility, but there were many 
different sorts of archaic people ar around the world before we got the modern Homo sapiens evolving. But the main implication of this is that for the last uh, one or two decades, we've really believed that once Homo sapiens evolved, they replaced all of these people around the world and did, didn't mate with them or incorporate any of their, their genes. But it was a very rigid speciation event. And what this is telling us is that our closest relatives were pretty much similar like us, and that it was possible to interbreed, and that perhaps the speciation event wasn't quite as rigid as we thought in the past. Indeed. Well, thanks very much, Jeffrey. That's Professor Jeffrey Long on the genetic evidence that most people alive today carry a little bit of Neanderthal or potentially another early human species in their genes. This work was presented at the recent meeting of the American Association of Physical Anthropologists annual meeting in Albuquerque, New Mexico. If you would like to read more about any of our news stories, you can find them at thenakedscientists.com forward slash news. Distilling the best science. The Naked Scientists. You're listening to The Naked Scientists with Diana O'Carroll and Kat Arney. If you would like to contact us through Twitter, it's at Naked Scientists, or you can send an email to chris at thenakedscientists.com. Kat. Now, this week we're looking at the science of archaeogenetics, where modern genetic techniques are used to complement traditional trowel-in-the-soil archaeology. And we're really honoured to have with us Professor Lord Colin Renfrew, who's Cambridge University archaeologist, and he's credited with being the person who coined the phrase archaeogenetics. So, hello, Colin. Hello. We tend to think of archaeology as, you know, people on their hands and knees digging with trowels in the soil. How does archaeogenetics work? How do we meld modern genetics with these kind of archaeological studies? Well, the remarkable thing is that um, most of what we've learned from archaeogenetics actually comes from specimens, uh, blood specimens or whatever, genetic specimens, taken from living populations. Uh, and the remarkable thing is that because um, the mitochondrial DNA is much the same from one generation to the next, or the Y chromosome DNA, much the same from one generation to the next, there's great stability. And by comparing living populations, uh, it's possible to uh, construct uh, trees, uh, which uh, it seems uh, give uh, a very persuasive um, account uh, of human descent. On the other hand, it is possible to take specimens of, from, um, uh, from long-dead uh, humans uh, and look at their DNA, the ancient DNA, uh, but that is a much more uh, difficult technique. And the picture we have of the out-of-Africa migrations of our species around 60,000 years ago essentially come from mitochondrial DNA uh, taken from uh, living people who are with us today or just of, of recent decades. So let's look at a little bit more at that mitochondrial DNA because obviously when, uh, you know, when humans are made by mummy and daddy, you mix mum and dad's chromosomes together. But why is mitochondrial DNA so special for that, these kind of studies? That's right. You've put your finger on it. As you say, um, most DNA, nuclear DNA, is, is a mixture of the DNA from the mother and from the father. But the mitochondrial DNA is passed on in the female line. So your mitochondrial DNA comes from your mother and hers from her mother and so on and indeed mine comes from my mother and from my maternal grandmother so it goes down in a single line in that way, a single lineage uh, and so there is very little variation unless there are mutations which happen infrequently so there's great stability and in this way uh, one can go back up the lineage as it were studying those mutations uh, and getting overall a picture uh, which has led to the conclusion and uh, uh, part of the conclusion comes from this work uh, that our species uh, must have originated in Africa something like 200,000 years ago and uh, all of us humans uh, are the uh, result of migrations out of Africa something like 60,000 years ago. So I've, I've read about things like the original Eves and this is because you can follow the mitochondrial DNA up the female line. How far back 
can we really go in terms of you could almost pinpoint one person or is it more just groups and populations? It's, um, it, it's a group, uh, certainly. One wouldn't want to pinpoint one person, though that may be theoretically possible. Well, you can go back to 200,000 years ago and that would be uh, one of the very first humans of our species, Homo sapiens. But you can, of course, go further up the descent line uh, where you get to the point where uh, our species or our ans- the ancestors of our species began to separate out from the Neanderthalers something like half a million years ago. Uh, and as we've heard, maybe not quite as separate as we'd previously yes, thought. Yes, well, that's very interesting uh, new uh, discovery. Um, the mainstream idea hitherto has been that uh, our species, em- Homo sapiens, emerged out of uh, uh, Africa uh, something like 60,000 years ago. And so it's very exciting uh, that there may have been Neanderthal survivors who have may, may have made contributions uh, to uh, the Homo sapiens genetic gene pool very exciting discovery so we've we've discussed how we can follow the the maternal line follow the women by looking at mitochondrial dna what about the chaps because obviously you have a y chromosome is is that as useful or is it less useful yes it is uh, as useful and uh, uh, it's been more difficult to do so it's come the the research has come about more recently uh, but the y chromosome has been extremely important because the non combining part of the y chromosome passes down exclusively in the male line, so in a way it's rather a mirror mirror image of what you find uh, on the female line with the mitochondrial DNA. Uh, The only problem is uh, that the chronology isn't secure. Dating is very difficult in uh, genetics and there is less confidence about the precision of of the Y chromosome DNA uh, dating. But certainly uh, it gives uh, a parallel picture which broadly supports uh, the conclusions that have emerged over the past uh, uh, 10 or 15 years from the mitochondrial DNA. And the sort of things that you're finding through studying DNA, studying mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome DNA, um, how do you actually anchor them to a real-life archaeological timeline? And do, do you ever find that it disagrees with the archaeological timeline? Well, somehow the research works to try and bring them into relationship. For instance, um, uh, the mitochondrial DNA dating uh, seems to uh, correlate fairly well uh, with the fossil record. For instance, we have the first uh, humans in Australia something like 50,000 years ago, Uh, And that ties in quite well with the out-of-Africa migration uh, along the southern uh, coasts of of Asia so that humans reached um, uh, Australia something like 50,000 years ago. Uh, And uh, the pattern works well. It works also uh, in the Americas where it seems that uh, uh, our species reached uh, uh, North America something like uh, 15,000 years ago or maybe a little more. So that the the archaeology and the... um, uh, the DNA uh, do harmonize together to some extent but as I say it's only more recently uh, that ancient DNA from uh, actual fossil humans uh, has been uh, uh, has been brought into play. And do you find that 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 really sort of ties everything together and helps you to anchor points? Well, uh, it's certainly certainly beginning to. If we're looking, for instance, at um, uh, the population history of Europe, when we look at uh, Neolithic remains, and there one can get uh, skeletons and look at the DNA, usually the mitochondrial DNA, which is usually better preserved, one can look at the haplogroups and begin to put together a story there. But there are quite a lot of problems, and I don't think everything is yet clear. This discipline is obviously uh, in its infancy and it has enormous potential because the, uh, the data are abundantly uh, rich or will be abundantly rich, uh, but there are still quite a lot of problems of interpretation. For instance, if we're looking at the origins of language families, there's a lot of uh, argument about that at the moment, which it was hoped DNA might solve very rapidly, but the solution hasn't quite yet come, although I think it's on the way. 
Excellent. And just very briefly, what really intrigues you? What's the mystery that you really want to, to get your teeth into? Well, I myself would like to uh, get clear on what are the origins of the uh, Indo-European language family. Uh, and that's difficult to determine from, because we're talking about languages there. Uh, and there are two main theories. One is that um, this fa language family might have emerged out of uh, Anatolia with the coming of the first farmers to Europe. Uh, and there's another uh, theory that it may have been to do with uh, the domestication of the horse uh, in the European steppes, which would put it at a much later date. But to bring the DNA and the archaeology and the linguistics together successfully is quite complicated, and I don't think we've quite got there yet. Excellent. Well, I'll keep you occupied for a while. Thank I you very so. much, Colin. Thank you. That's Professor Lord Colin Renfrew on the marriage of genetics and archaeology. Now, he'll be with us for the rest of the show. So if you do have any questions or for, for him or for us, please do get them in. If you want to contact us at all through Twitter, it's at Naked Scientists. And you can send an email to chris at thenakedscientists.com. Laying the facts bare. I say. The Naked Scientists. You're listening to The Naked Scientists with Diana O'Carroll and Kat Arney. We're looking at the science of archaeogenetics this week. And still to come, we'll find out what genetic analysis tells us about a 4,000-year-old man and Ben and Dave test an ancient trick for sterilising water. But now it's time to join Mira Sentellingham. Mira's been out in London this week finding out how the DNA of ancient pathogens, that's things like bacteria found in ancient human bones and tissues, can be extracted and sequenced to help us understand more about the evolution of diseases such as tuberculosis. This week, I've come along to University College London to meet Dr Helen Donoghue, who's a senior lecturer in medical microbiology. Helen, you focus on the occurrence of particular pathogens in our past. So what's the importance of understanding more about their occurrence in our past? Well, I happen to be in a department that has a long-standing interest in a group of bacteria called mycobacteria that include the bacteria that cause tuberculosis and leprosy. But it also so happens that these are particularly good subjects to look at in the past. This is because they are surrounded by very resistant cell walls which protects the DNA. And the DNA itself, its chemical composition is more stable than that of some other bacteria. What kind of samples then do you work with and how old are they? The age of the samples varies greatly. I think the oldest one I've ever looked at was from a Pleistocene bison 17,500 years ago, and the oldest human samples I've looked at were 9,000 years old. Generally, they're not quite so old as that. I've got a large number of samples, for instance, from a collection from the 18th century in Hungary, so that would be 17 or 1800s, and really all the ages between then and ancient Egypt, everything in between. Now, Helen, we are here in your lab in the Department of Infection. You've got some samples here in front of us today. One particular one I can see looks like a rib. So tell me more about this sample. OK, well, I'll take it out so we can see it a bit more clearly. It's from a child. It's a lower rib from the Hungarians from the 1800s. It's curved, but... It's about 15 centimetres long. We had quite a few children in this group of individuals. Children are not quite so susceptible as adults for tuberculosis, but the results I've got so far do show that many of them were infected with TB. The reason why we're interested in looking at a rib is because tuberculosis is an infection. Normally, we catch it by breathing an infected aerosol. It goes into our lungs, and the lungs are the main site of infection. And when somebody dies, the evidence of the disease can be left on the outer surface of the ribs that were next to the lung. Now, as well as the rib, what other parts of the body can you target when obtaining your samples? Well, once tuberculosis breaks out of the lung and gets into the bloodstream, it can go all around the body. Also, you can catch tuberculosis by swallowing infected sputum or by eating or drinking infected milk or meat, perhaps from an infected animal. But actually, that's very rare in the archaeological record. 
but I've certainly found evidence of tuberculosis in the abdomen and in bones that don't show any sign of any lesion, and that's because they were infected via the bloodstream. How careful do you have to be with your samples? Because I imagine, first of all, they must be rare, and second of all, you must not want to destroy very much of it. Well, luckily, we don't need very much. So normally when I do an extraction, I use between 20 and 60 milligrams of sample. That's if it's bony sample. You need rather more than that if it's mummified. You can have that much without destroying the bone. So I guess having identified if particular individuals from the past had tuberculosis, how does this all, say, come together? What does it tell us about our past? Well, let me just say something about one of the collections I've got, which are from the 18th century Hungarians. They've got a very good archive. So we know the age and family relationships of many of the individuals, and there are over 200 of them. That means we can do some epidemiology, we can look at family groups, we can look and see, uh, because the samples are very well preserved, we can actually look at different lineages of the MTB DNA. We know there were at least two distinct lineages of MTB DNA at that time, and this is from an era before there were any antibiotics. We know there were many people in this population who lived to a great age even though they were infected with TB. We know there were other people who died in early in life or in their early 20s of TB. This gives us the chance to look at the evolution of the bacterial infecting organism and its human host over time from an age before there was any distortion in how these bacteria evolved because there was no antibiotic therapy. And that enables us to compare that with the modern day trend. And we can see that there is now a logarithmic, an exponential increase in the rate of change of the organism. And how important would you say it is then to understand more about tuberculosis? Tuberculosis is probably the greatest cause of death from any single infectious disease in the world today. According to the World Health Organization, we think one third of the world's population is infected and in 2007 there were just under two million deaths and this is from a disease where we can treat with antibiotics even though drug resistance is becoming an increasing problem. So we really do need to understand our relationship between ourselves and this particular species. How can this research help us understand more about our past and our ancestors? Well, both tuberculosis and leprosy are examples of clonal diseases where the infecting bacterium has sometimes a lifelong relationship with its human host and so as humans migrate these bacteria migrate with them so by studying these organisms or the DNA from these organisms from samples from different geographical sites around the world we can understand how humans have migrated around the world that was Dr Helen Donoghue from University College London talking to Mira Senthillingham about how reading an ancient pathogen's DNA can help us understand how the bacteria that cause diseases like tuberculosis have evolved alongside us. And if you want to check out Helen's work, there's an exhibition showcasing her work on ancient tuberculosis called Body Matters, which will be in the Leventis Gallery in the UCL Institute of Archaeology from the 17th of May. Keeping you abreast of the world's best science... The Naked Scientists. This is The Naked Scientists with Diane O'Carroll and Kat Arney. As well as following the way populations have changed and migrated, we can use modern genetic techniques to really get to know an individual body, as long as it's preserved well enough. Professor Eski Villislev is from the University of Copenhagen, where he's the leader of an ancient DNA and evolution group. So, Eski, can you tell us what are the problems about getting ancient DNA samples? Well, I think, I mean, it varies a lot. The problems or the magnitude of the problems actually varies a lot from one specimen or one type of specimen to another. But obviously, one of the biggest problems you have when you're looking at ancient human remains due to contamination with with modern human DNA, because many of these specimens uh, has been handled by humans without, you know, protective gloves or anything like that. And also the reagents that you're buying has all been produced by humans, so you can actually have traces of, of modern human DNA in there. How do you get around that? How can you avoid that contamination? Yeah. I think that the last few years have actually 
that we're actually seeing a kind of a revolution within ancient human genetics in the sense that some new technological uh, breakthroughs has happened that makes it possible for one thing, getting very, very short pieces of DNA out of, of the specimens. And the thing is that the copy number, you know, of a certain piece of DNA in the genius DNA actually increases tremendously if you go shorter and shorter in terms of the DNA you try to retrieve. So that makes a huge, huge difference. You basically, if you go short enough, you can almost swap the contaminant DNA by actually the indigenous DNA. Additionally, you can say the, the knowledge we have gained about how DNA damage through time can also provide evidence to what extent you have, uh, you're working with indigenous DNA or uh, suffering from, uh, from contamination. So, so some of these breakthroughs uh, really means a lot. Another thing is that you, if you're working with, with specimens from another ethnic group, for example, let's say specimens that have been in Britain, stored in Britain, but comes from non-British people, well, then there's actually ways to, you can say, distinguish the DNA you have from being European to some other ethnic group. So there's ways around it. So you're using these shorter pieces, but can you then sequence it in the same way that you sequence fresh DNA? Yeah, in fact, you can. I mean, with with these uh, second generation high throughput sequencing uh, platforms that has has appeared over the last few years, uh, there you can actually sequence ancient DNA in the same way as you can with modern DNA. Of course, there's some 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 issues you don't have with modern DNA. For example, if you have a bone specimen, you know, the, it's full of bacteria, for example, additional to any modern human contamination that m- must have penetrated the bone. And therefore, a lot of what you get out when you do what we call shotgun sequencing will in fact be microbial DNA from such a specimen, while from a modern sample, you know, uh, 99 point something percent of the DNA would be human. So it's more demanding to deal with, uh, with ancient DNA, certainly. And probably a bit more expensive. But tell us about Inuk, the, uh, the guy you studied. What did you have to work on there? Yeah, there we worked on, uh, on ancient hair. So it's hair from a 4,000-year-old individual. And hair is actually a, a really good source of ancient DNA in the sense that it's not porous like bone. And therefore, neither uh, you know, modern con- human contamination, neither microbial contamination over the years penetrates very fine to, to the hair. And all the contamination is on the surface, so it's quite easy to clean the hair samples from contamination, opposite bones, for example, that are porous and where the contamination penetrates very deep. So uh, from that point of view, it was reasonable easy. It wasn't easy, but reasonable easy to actually sequence uh, the majority of of the genome, the complete genome of of this individual. And once you'd done that, what did you find out about him? Well, that was actually quite interesting, and I think it shows some of the power of, of using ancient DNA because, first of all, I mean, the only thing that people have actually found from this culture, which was, was the first people who settled in the New World Arctic, it means Alaska, Canada, and Greenland, is in fact, you know, a few pieces of hair and then four small pieces of human bone, okay? And that's everything, all we know biologically about these individuals. And by sequencing the genome of, of this person, we could show, well, he, was, he is a male. We could also show, you know, he had brown skin, dark eyes. You know, we could see he had tendency to baldness, for example. So he probably died quite young because it was a fair amount of hair we found from this, uh, from this guy. We could also see he had dry earwax. We could see that he was genetically adapted to living in cold temperatures, although his people hadn't been there for a very long time. We could see what blood type uh, this individual had. We could say something about, you know, his body's stature, that he had a relatively uh, low uh, surface area compared to body mass and and stuff like that. So, you know, there was a quite a number of, of, you can say, phenotypic traits that we could actually retrieve from the genome. But additionally to that, we could actually see that he came from an, a migration that had been independent of of those migrations that resulted in present-day Inuits that are people in the, the New World Arctic and also independent of that migration or those migrations giving rise to contemporary Native Americans. We actually found evidence of, a, you can say, previously 
unrecognized migration from the old world into the new world happening sometimes around 5,500 years ago. That seems a bit more recent than you know previous estimates of input. So you know that's well, definitely independent because of the date. Uh, well, it's definitely independent and it's, it's, it's earlier than you can see in in that migration that they raised to to present day Inuits or Eskimos, if you want, you know that uh, you know culturally they are only around thousand years or a little bit more than thousand years years old. But the thing is, we could see that this guy is actually closer, clo- more closely related to people uh, in northeastern Siberia than he is to ni- to either Inuits or uh, to Native Americans. Well, that from a few pieces of hair. Thanks, Eski. That's Eski Villaslev on what we can learn from seemingly insignificant remains, provided there's some DNA. And now it's time to get experimental. All week there's been a rather funny smell hanging around Dave, and we were all too polite to say anything. Of course, his standards of hygiene haven't slipped. It was all in the name of kitchen science. Here's Ben to explain more. As this week's show is looking into the genetics of the past, we thought for Kitchen Science we'd do an experiment where we look at something with a good, strong historical precedent. Dave, what are we doing? Well, there's archaeological evidence for ancient peoples like the Egyptians using silver to purify water because silver is supposed to be very good at killing bugs. So I thought I'd try and test this. Isn't it really hard for us to tell if water is actually clean, if it's been purified? That's right. I mean, part of the problem with dirty water is you can't tell whether it's clean or dirty until you fall horribly ill. So I thought instead of using water, we could use something which you can tell if it's gone off. I thought we tried using milk. Well, that explains the smell. I thought it was just you. But why is it that silver should kill off the bugs and the bad stuff in water or in milk? Well, silver is basically a heavy metal, a bit like lead or copper. All of these things are actually quite bad for life. They act as catalysts, and they can catalyse all sorts of reactions which shouldn't be going on in a cell. And also they can get in the way of proteins and cause them to change shape in all sorts of strange ways. So by catalysing the reactions, it changes the chemistry of something like a bacterium and therefore should kill it off. Yeah, and the special thing about silver is, for some reason, it isn't very poisonous to humans. So you can drink something with a reasonable amount of silver in it. It won't do you too much harm unless you take too much silver when it can actually change the colour of your skin. But even then, it doesn't seem to be very poisonous. So we shouldn't drink any of this milk lest we end up going blue. But what have you actually done? What have you set up here? In a rather naive way, as a physicist, I thought, well, let's just try getting some milk, leaving it to go off. In some glasses of milk, we'll put in some silver, which ought to slow the process down. In others, we'll just leave them alone. I thought as a control, we'll put in some bits of steel. So I've got a variety of bits of cutlery, some of it silver-plated and some of it stainless steel, but some in some cups, others in others, and none in in a third set. So why shouldn't steel do the same thing? If it's the fact that metals cause this catalysis, then surely the steel's going to do the same job as the silver. Well, steel is mostly iron and iron is incredibly common in biology. And so almost all living things will have developed ways of dealing with iron. In fact, you use it in haemoglobin in your blood. And so iron shouldn't be very poisonous to things. Also, this is stainless steel, which has a layer on the surface of it, which stops rusting and dissolving. And you've now done this experiment twice. You've left one set around for three days, and they, judging by the smell, are getting really quite ripe. And there's another set that have only been there for about 24 hours or so. What results are we seeing? Possibly not as clear as I would have liked. The ones which have been only around for 24 hours, if you try smelling them, they all smell slightly off. They've got that smell where if you were to get your milk out of the fridge and it smelled like that, you'd think, better get some more milk soon, but you'd probably still make some tea. (laughs) And that seems to go for those with cutlery in both steel and silver as well as the cups that have just got milk in if you look at the older ones something interesting has actually happened okay so the three day old milk the cups where it just has milk it's gone a bit yellow there's sort of an oily residue on the top oh (laughs) and that smell actually makes me feel quite ill yeah despite that if you look at them they look less off than the other two I don't really want to have to sniff these again, but looking at the ones with silver cutlery in, that also is a bit lumpy. 
Ugh, it also smells horrible. And looking at one with stainless steel in it, well, it smells awful, but it looks like yoghurt. Yep, yoghurt is basically just milk, which has had a bacteria inside it, which grows and grows and grows. It eats the lactose, creates lactic acid from that. And that causes casein inside the milk, which is a protein, to change its shape and sort of all tangle together and form a big mesh, which makes it much more viscous and kind of gloopy and yogurty. Well, that makes yogurt sound a little bit less appealing. But so the two cups with stainless steel spoons in have basically turned to yogurt. The ones with silver in are looking quite manky. But actually, the cleanest looking ones, the nicest looking ones, if I was forced at gunpoint to drink one of them, I'd go for the ones that haven't had any cutlery in at all. I think this is probably actually quite a bad experimental technique. Coming as a physicist, I didn't think to sterilise all of the bits of metal before I put them in, which means that all of the um, bits of cutlery have probably taken in lots of exciting bacteria which were sitting around on their surface. So the ones with metal in them have had a, a head start, so they've gone off a bit quicker. But it does seem that the silver hasn't gone off nearly as quickly as the steel, so there probably is some effect. So it does look like the silver may have made some difference, not that I'd really put any of this in my tea. Now, you keep saying that you've approached this as a physicist and that's made it a bit difficult. What do you think you should have done? There's various things I should have done. If you want to try this at home, I would suggest doing these as well. Obviously, the first one is to clean all the cutlery very well, probably put it through a dishwasher or soak it in alcohol or something to kill all the bugs on it and do the same thing with the pots which you're putting things in. The second thing is you probably want to give everything the same start of bacteria. And it seems that making yoghurt is a really good way to tell if the bacteria have been growing well. So what I would do is get some live yoghurt and put a bit of live yoghurt into each cup. Only a little tiny bit, much less than a spoonful, but the same in each cup. And everything's starting from the same place and they've all got bugs in there to start with so you can actually test whether the metal has any effect. So that would be a much fairer test, and then you could just see which ones make yoghurt the quickest, or in fact, if the silver ones fail to make yoghurt at all. But do please give it a go at home. We're really keen to hear from anybody who's tried this with slightly better experimental technique than Dave to try and confirm whether or not silver really does keep things sterile. We'll be back with more Kitchen Science very soon. Ugh, it's a good job we can't smell them from here. That was Ben and Dave testing the ancient idea that silver can sterilise water or a silver coin will help keep your milk fresh for longer. Do try it out. We'd love to hear from you and your uh, yoghurt-making experiments. We'll put instructions online at thenakedscientist.com slash kitchen science, where you can also find loads of other experiments to try at home. So do send us your results. You can email us at chris at thenakedscientist.com. This is The Naked Scientist with Diana O'Carroll and Kat Arney. Now, Colin, I have a question for you. It's from Les from Over, and he says, where and when did all the different human ancestor species originate? Well, the fascinating thing is that uh, the fossils, uh, the fossil remains, give us a very clear picture, and most of them originated in Africa. There was a theory that maybe... Um, the Homo erectus form, that was about two million years ago, might have been ancestral to our species, Homo sapiens, uh, but um, the DNA helps confirm that you have to go back to Africa to find the ancestors of Homo sapiens, back to Homo erectus. Before that, three million years ago, Australopithecus. So Africa is the answer. I see. And how long ago are we talking? I mean, you mentioned three billion. But... Three million. Sorry, sorry, three million. Sorry. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, uh, the African ancestors go back before that, uh, but things start to happen sort of three or four million years ago in a way where you've got Australopithecus, and then you get the first tool makers, which is very important, about three million years ago with Homo habilis. Uh, so uh, once you get people making tools, stone tools, that's when you really feel you're dealing with uh, our real ancestors. Thank you. And Kat, I've got a slightly unrelated question here from you, and it's from Leah, and she asks, uh, my grandmother warned that dyeing your hair makes it turn white faster. Uh, is this true? Um, well, maybe if, uh, if you were trying to do a DNA analysis on it, it might be relevant. Um, no, I think that this isn't true because um, hair dye works on your hair, which is kind of dead. The bit that produces the colour of your hair is the, uh, the 
pigment, the, the melanin pigment that's in, in the hair follicle, and this isn't affected by hair dye. I think probably if you're dyeing your hair, you might notice that you're going grey, the white hair's um, coming through more, or maybe when you stop dyeing it, suddenly you're like, crikey, I'm really grey. <laughs> but um, I, don't, I don't think that dyeing your hair is actually going to affect your, your hair follicles, so no, I don't think it makes you go white faster. Fantastic. Well, I think now it's about time for question of the week. And the question this week, how many candles should be on the cake? My name is Mike Mohali. I'm calling from uh, Pretoria. We have a great-grandmother. We are not sure exactly how old is she. And uh, according to the Home Affairs, they're saying she was born in 1902. So we strongly believe that uh, it's not the accurate age for our great-grandmother. So she needs us to help find someone who can establish exactly in which way she was born. So if someone's birth certificate is absent, how can they work out their age? My name is Kirsty Spalding and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Cell and Molecular Biology at the Karolinska Institute, which is located in Stockholm in Sweden. So there's a couple of ways you could do this, both involving a newly developed strategy, which is radiocarbon dating. And essentially, because of the Cold War, there was a whole lot of above-ground nuclear bomb testing. And during this uh, procedure, there was a lot of detonations which caused neutron emissions into the atmosphere. And essentially, to make a long story short, this ultimately resulted in increased levels of carbon-14 in our atmosphere. And this actually occurred for some years during the period of the Cold War. Then they put this uh, test ban treaty out, banning all above-ground nuclear bomb testing. And then the C14 levels in the atmosphere changed in a very predictable way with time so that for any given time point, the proportion of C14 to C12 represents a particular year in time. So one way we've developed to use this strategy to look at cell turnover in the human body is to look at the DNA of cells. And by determining the proportion of the radioactive carbon-14 to the stable isotope, carbon-12, we're able to say when this cell was born. And we've been applying this to different parts of the human brain and body and actually found that there are select regions of neurons, that's the nerve cells of the brain, that are as old as we are. And so by taking some brain cells from this region of the brain, cortex, cerebellum, for example, we're able to take out the DNA from these cells, carbon date them, and they will tell us the year of birth of the individual. But what if you don't particularly want to take a sample from a living person's brain? This is a perhaps more cumbersome way to determine age. Um, another way that I've developed with colleagues, and this actually uses the C14 to C12 ratio in tooth enamel. So in this methodology, you can take teeth from an individual, so in this case from your 100-year-old granny, and depending on which tooth it is, you determine how old the enamel is, and each tooth lays down the enamel at a different, different time point, which we've decoded in a way so we know how long for each tooth it takes for them to make enamel. We can figure out then from this information the carbon dating of the enamel when the person's born, and we can combine this with other methodologies to then find out when they died and how old they were when they died. So this is, the, without a doubt, the most precise way to determine the age of an individual. Yes, you can date the DNA in certain neurons in the brain, or you can take a sample from your teeth. Amazingly, it is possible to carbon date living people so long as they have lived through or just after the Cold War testing period. And on the forum, we had some alternative recommendations, including ask your mum uh, if she's still around, ask your mummy if you're Egyptian, and ask the person in question what on earth they can remember about their life. <laughs> and next week, we will have another active radio question requiring an answer. Hi, Naked Scientists. My name is Jeff. I teach at the University of Pittsburgh in the United States, and I'm a big fan of the program, as is my daughter, Sam. I thought of this while listening to the naked scientists in my car. We've all heard the way in which sounds change frequency as an ambulance passes us with its siren going. What I wonder is whether a conventional radio broadcast experiences Doppler shift when we're driving toward or away from the transmitter. Does the pitch or more likely the tempo of a pop song go up if I'm driving toward the transmitter even if I can't perceive it? I figured that the Doppler effect wouldn't affect digital broadcast, but I'd like to know about that as well. 
Thank you. Are radio signals affected by the Doppler shift? Let us know your thoughts by emailing us with the address chris at thenakedscientists.com or you can write on our forum to share your answers with everyone and we'll pick out the best one. You can find it online at thenakedscientists.com forward slash forum. Thank you, Diana. And that's all we have time for this week. We've been delving back into our genetic and archaeological past. Next week, we're all looking into the future and around the world around us, looking at the science and technology that tells us where we are. That's the GPS, the Global Positioning System. We're going to be finding out exactly how they work, how on earth does that little annoying box in your car talk to satellites and tell them to turn left, why do satellites need their own form of GPS? And they do because they uh, have a GPS that uses distant quasars as their guide. We're also going to find out how GPS can be spoofed or fooled into thinking you're in the wrong place, so perfect for any spies out there. And in Kitchen Science, we'll be exploring some of the more traditional ways to find out where on earth you are. Uh, if you've got any questions or comments for us, please email us, chris at thenakedscientist.com. You can tweet us at Naked Scientists. If you want to catch up with anything we've done, see our experiments or follow up on the news, go to the website that's thenakedscientist.com and many thanks to Geoffrey Long Colin Renfrew Helen Donoghue and Eski Villaslev for joining us this week and to our production team that's Mira St. Billingham Dave Ansell Tom Simpkins and Ben Valsler The Naked Scientist podcast comes to you from Cambridge University and is supported by the Wellcome Trust the EPSRC and UK Fast for more information look us up online at nakedscientist.com Naked Scientist